uh, Kate Hudson, our General Secretary of CND for, for a number of years now. Um, and I want to thank her personally for all the work that she's been doing, also for all the work from the people in the CND office in London who work incredibly hard and do some brilliant stuff, turn out some wonderful materials that we can all use, also staff elsewhere in some of the regional offices around the country who do a fantastic job all the time working more than they're paid for, certainly, and they're not paid very much for doing what they do. So, uh, Increasing militarism, the threats of nuclear use, the rise of the far right and reactionary nationalism, the increasing incidents of racism and xenophobia, or indeed the rapid increase in climate change and environmental degradation. These are all great threats that we face. So as Ryan has just remarked, we're all trying to understand what is actually going on in the world. What are the global dynamics and trends that are taking us at an accelerating rate, it seems, towards a new and very unpleasant reality based on intolerance, exclusion, and might makes right? Which means, on the one hand, an end to the values and rights that we've pretty much taken for granted over decades, and on the other, a race towards nuclear annihilation. <coughs> And we want to understand what's going on in the world because we want to work out what to do about it. Now, over the past months, I've been increasingly drawn to thinking about our work in the early years of this century. Indeed, Ryder just mentioned 2003. The great struggles, for example, against the war on Iraq and the whole framework of the so-called war on terror of Bush and Blair. Now, there are, of course, some obvious parallels, not least any of you see Trump holding forth at the UN recently. I mean, what a throwback to 2002 and George Bush's axis of evil speech. At that time, we remember that Bush named Iraq, Iran, and North Korea. In Trump's speech, he referred to a small group of rogue regimes, but he actually expanded that list. Of course, this time Iraq wasn't there. We know what happened to Iraq, but he repeated Iran and North Korea, and he added Syria, and this time Cuba and Venezuela also <laughs> added. So it's an expanding target list that we see from the US president. But thinking back 15 years, I also remember the many discussions we had as a movement about what was driving US policy. We had, I remember, great discussions analyzing the project for a new American century. Many of you will remember that, driven by the neocons around Bush. And of course, we were much assisted in our work at that time, not only by the internationalization of the anti-war movement, which Ryan referred to, you know, the mass millions and millions around the world mobilized, but also by two other powerful <coughs> global movements. The anti-neoliberal globalization movement, for example. That was a great thing at the turn of the century. And the strength of that movement was so great that it actually overthrew the MAI, the Multilateral Agreement on Investment. And it did that by building an alliance of civil society organizations together with the developing countries, in particular in the Global South. And of course, we also remember the World Social Forum movement, which drew together all these forces in an unprecedented level of global solidarity and global cooperation. Now, there were a number of explanations and conclusions we drew then, which I think are equally relevant for what we're facing today, if not more relevant. The first 
is that the US is a declining economy which seeks to maintain its global role through military expansion, yeah. intervention, and its overwhelming military might. And we've just heard how it is stepping that up and increasing it. And at that time, 2003, there was much theorizing about the behavior of declining empires. And thinking back, I was quite uh, shocked recently to hear Trump kind of described as a kind of new Nero. You know, so there are people out there also making that parallel with the decline of the Roman Empire. But really, the behavior of declining empires and the damage they do as they go down, as they kind of resist their declining role in the world. And I think we're seeing the same, uh, yet now in a more extreme way, with even greater dangers. So for example, we've seen a kind of an economic rebalancing in the world. We're seeing the rise of China. But the US approach to that, to the economic rise of China, has not been to accept there is a developing multipolar world, and that's the reality, where we cooperate to solve existential threats like climate change, for example, but their response is to engage in increasingly threatening behavior, from the global expansion of NATO, to the US so-called pivot to Asia, to the proliferation of bases, so-called missile defense systems across Europe and Asia. And these are clearly posed against Russia and China, not as the US laughably claims against Iran and North Korea. And despite Trump's early claims that suggested that he would oppose interventionism, that he would somehow kind of retreat into America, putting it first and kind of leaving everyone else to get on with it, on the contrary, we have seen a militant reorientation towards interventionism, a drive towards greater confrontation, whether in North Korea where US policy under Bush has directly led to the current crisis and has been exacerbated by Trump, or whether in Iran, where his attempts to sabotage the Iranian nuclear deal will just lead to nuclear proliferation and war, or in Venezuela, where he has ratcheted up the threats going beyond the sanctions he had recently imposed to effectively put Venezuela on notice of military intervention. The other conclusion we drew at that time was that it is through international solidarity and cooperation amongst peoples and movements that change can be brought about, that our voices can be heard, that we can understand our power and that we can act upon it. And I believe that that is a profound lesson for us today because of the tendency coming from the political right to withdraw behind national boundaries, to exclude the other, to blame ordinary people, people like us, for the social and economic ills that we face, rather than putting the blame squarely where it lies, which is 30 years of neoliberal economic policy and the systematic dismantling of our welfare state and the social values that underpin it. And this must also shape our understanding of what cooperation is and what kind of cooperation we are seeking and supporting. Because we rightly urge cooperation between states in diplomacy and negotiation, such as achieved by the Iranian nuclear deal. And in the same way, we urge a resumption of the six-party talks to resolve the North Korean issue this is cooperation from above, at state level, and we seek it and we welcome it. But that's not enough. We must also recognize the crucial and preeminent importance of cooperation from below, because this is what will truly make change possible. And by this, I mean the way we work together within and between our organizations cooperating across national boundaries and strengthening our movement globally. For it is only through our international solidarity, our international cooperation as peoples and movements, that we will be able to bring enough pressure to bear to bring about real global change. We have indeed 
seen the power of this approach recently, as other speakers have said, with the achievement of the UN Global Ban Treaty. Cooperation not only between states to produce the treaty, but made possible through working with civil society too, a powerful role which has been explicitly recognized. So the challenges are many, but the pathway is clear and it is indeed possible. The unity of our movements in renewed international cooperation as a force for change, a true global counterbalance to the forces of confrontation. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you, Kate. Um, so we've had the four speakers um, on the panel.